Um, so as we were putting together our go-to-market plan, Phoenix popped as a really interesting place for us to start. And cars before, but now you're moving on to proper driverless cars with consumers in them, right? So that's in the near future. A few months away? That's right. Um, so we started earlier this year something we call the Early Rider Program. Um, we announced this in the spring. Um, within 24 hours, we had 10,000 hand raisers in the Chandler, Phoenix, Awatuki area saying, I'd love to help you define the future of, <laughs> of self-driving cars. Yeah. Uh, sign me up. Um, so we, we've taken a small subset of those folks and given them access to the cars over the last six months or so. We've seen how they've used the cars, how they've um, sort of integrated self-driving cars into their daily lives, and we've learned a lot um, in that. Um, now we're at the point where we're close to saying to those same folks, would you be willing to go for a ride with us without that test driver in the front seat? Test, I'm telling you, there'll be a good opportunity. Yeah. Why is now the right time? Because you've been working for years now, and you've covered four million miles. Why was maybe six months ago not the right time, or why do you not need to wait another six months? What makes now the right time? There's a confluence of a lot of things, um, you know, certainly hitting that mileage, um, getting the confidence that we need um, to put these cars on the road without a human driver in the front seat. Um, in simulation, we've learned a lot, Tim, and I think I, I can't underestimate this point. Um, that real-world driving is really important, but we amplify and multiply the impact of that real-world driving in simulation. It gives us much greater confidence that, that we actually have a very good safety story. And you mentioned uh, legislation in Phoenix being somewhat attractive. I'm guessing the absence of weather there has a bit of a factor, too. I mean, Phoenix you know, is a pretty, pretty there, mild climate. There are pros and cons to um, Phoenix. Um, and to give you an example, um, we did hot weather testing this summer um, in famous places for those of you who know about the Davis Dam test and other testing that's typically done in and around Las Vegas. It turns out it was hotter in Phoenix during our hot weather testing period. Um, so that temperature um, is actually a very challenging situation for, for sensors and compute and other things. But lack of snow, though, I'm guessing is a benefit. Yeah. Lack of snow is definitely a benefit, yeah, yeah which is why we're expanding now, and we've got cars driving around in Michigan getting ready for the snow there this year. Now, one of the big questions that we as journalists have had through all this entire process of watching the self-driving car project evolve into Waymo has been, how are you guys going to actually make money off of this? And I think that's something we've been learning a little bit more about recently with upcoming partnerships. What can you tell me about the plan there? What are, kind of partnerships do you have in place? And what sort of vision do you see for, for that side of the business, which ultimately will make the business? That's great. Um, so, I mean, the, the first point is, I think a lot of people had thought of this project as, in some fashion, a car company. Um, but we're really not a car company. Our, our job is to make the world's most experienced driver. So that's, that's first and foremost. We're, we're building really great, really safe drivers that can be deployed in a lot of ways. Um, the first way we'll be going to market is with the Waymo transportation service, right? So getting folks anywhere they want to go from point A to point B. Um, We'll have various manifestations of that business um, come to light over the course of the next several months. Um, it also makes sense for logistics um, and trucking and moving goods from place to place. Mm. Um, and we've shared a little bit about um, putting this same suite of sensors and compute um, into a large Class 8 truck. The good news is it works very well with la very little modification required uh, to drive a very big truck down the road. Um, so there's more to come on that. We've also had a lot of interest from OEMs on personal use and licensing applications. So I think you can see um, and can easily imagine um, those sorts of applications going forward. And finally, cities around the world are really interested in how this technology can help transform them. Um, so that aspect of unwrapping the last mile, the very challenging last mile, yeah. getting people from their homes or work um, to existing public um, transfer or public transport infrastructure um, is something that we're also working on. Why was there so much secrecy around business plan? I mean, you were so transparent with driving. We see reports every month of exactly how many incidents, but we really haven't heard anything about the business model until very recently. Was that intentional? That's a great question. It was, and it was totally intentional, Tim. So I think we're in a very privileged space, being an alphabet company. Um, we haven't had to worry about our next round of funding is, is maybe junior companies 
um, looking forward to the next um, venture funding yeah. round or IPO might be. And we're not a traditional um, automotive company worried about the, our stock market multiple. We are in this very privileged place. So we really didn't have to worry or, or talk about um, that aspect of our commercial launch. We were, of course, working on it. Mm -hmm. We just weren't talking about it. Sure. And we thought the right time to talk about it was um, after we demonstrated the technology was viable. And speaking of traditional automotive companies, obviously there are a lot of traditional automotive companies working in the same space, trying to develop the same technology. Uh, how much interest have you had from them in terms of partnering with you, licensing your technology, that kind of thing? How big of a, a revenue stream do you see that being down the road? Um, well, I think it's, it's super interesting. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of interest um, from both sides. We're interested in talking to the automotive companies. They've been very interested in speaking with us as well. Um, I think you'll see more from us in the future. Um, for now, all I can say is that FCA has been an amazing partner, and um, I think we're very lucky um, to have FCA as our first partner. The, the Pacifica minivans have been brilliant in service. So self-driving Pacifica is coming to your dealer soon, I think is the lesson there. You didn't say it, I did. Uh, but th does that mean that the auto industry has been warm and receptive, do you think? Because when a Android Auto first started coming to market, for example, I heard a lot of concern, ultimately, about bringing Google into the car. There's a lot of manufacturers who thought that they're going to be handing over a little bit too much information. Do you think that manufacturers will be a little bit more warm and welcoming when it comes to getting help in such an important thing as this, especially given how much testing that you've done so far? Or do you think there'll still be that level of concern and maybe mistrust? I think it varies um, company by company, and each company is going to have their own strategy, I think, in, in going after this space. I think no matter what, if you're a car company, though, it makes sense to put a lot of effort into understanding self-driving. Um, even if you decide not to go forward, um, you realize the extent of the challenge, mm -hmm. and you can become, therefore, I think, a better purchaser mm -hmm. um, or licensor of, of that technology, the more you know. Now, we've talked a little bit about scale and ultimately growing this. And you know, this is something that we, everyone believes will be a major impactor on the automotive industry as a whole. How do you see this sort of business scaling up going forward? You talked about uh, commercial partnerships and deliveries and that kind of thing. But going mass market, I'm presuming we're talking going a fair bit bigger than that down the road. Yeah, well, if you look at um, one of our business lines, which is a transportation service, it makes sense for us to launch in one city and then grow to other cities. Perhaps they're contiguous. Um, perhaps they share a certain street or road graph or weather characteristics um, and then move out in that organic fashion. Um, I think that's how you would see a scale um, from the Waymo Transportation mm -hmm. Service okay. standpoint. Um, we'd have other opportunities with logistics and trucking to, to do something discontinuous, um, working with partners um, uh, on the logistics side. So from a municipality standpoint, let's say I'm a mayor of a town and I want Waymo to, to launch the service there, what sort of things should I be positioning in my town to make me look like the best opportunity to be the next Phoenix, basically? I think it's a great question, and I, I think there might be a little bit of a misunderstanding, at least from our standpoint, about what makes a good city partner. Mm -hmm. um, part of what we've been trying to do with our technology is to make it completely autonomous and not reliant on any new or incremental infrastructure or infrastructure change. I think that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just willingness um, and openness in partnering. Um, we've had a wonderful situation in, in the southeast portion of Phoenix where the local mayors there have been open to, for example, um, letting us understand how the cars respond to emergency vehicles mm -hmm. and making sure there's good communication um, in those areas. So I think just that sort of openness and in, in willingness to learn. So just to be clear, you're not looking for any vehicle to vehicle, to vehicle communications or V2I infrastructure investments or anything like that ultimately, because that's a, a pretty large part of the equation for a lot of other companies working on autonomy, but your cars are largely independent of, of any kind of technology like that. Yeah, it's, you know, and we're not saying that V2V isn't, isn't a great idea. It's just the issue that if you make your autonomous technology reliant on that V2V and then something goes wrong with the V2V, you've got a problem. So you've, you've got to make the car truly autonomous um, in that way, not just without a human driver, but without reliance on too much infrastructure. 
and of course a lot of that depends on the ability of the car to see the world around it. And a sensor package that you developed has been a big part of the, the piece of the puzzle as well. Uh, at the beginning of the year in Detroit, you made some announcements about the anticipated cost and the development there. How are things progressing on that front? Because obviously getting the cost of that hardware down will be a major factor in the ultimate success of autonomy. That's right. So um, I think a lot of folks, when they think about the Google self-driving project, now Waymo, think of it as a software exercise. Um, and certainly there is a lot of software. There's a lot of AI and, and machine learning in, in what we do. Um, but the real magic sauce comes, I think, with the integration of that software with our own homegrown hardware. Um, so we've developed our own um, vision systems. We've developed our own radar. We now have developed three uh, different, a short range, a medium range, and a long range LiDAR system. They're all homegrown. Um, and we've continued to progress um, the quality, um, the accuracy, and the cost of, of all of those systems. What about aesthetics? Is it a bigger challenge to get the cost down, or is it going to be a bigger challenge to actually hide that into a normal, normal looking car? So here's the thing. I, I wish we could ask for audience participation on this one. Um, imagine you're five years out from now, and you have the choice between two different cars. Mm -hmm. They're otherwise identical. Um, one of them has a dome on top mm -hmm. that is an all-seeing, all-knowing dome filled with sensors. Wouldn't that say to you that I'm a car that has extrasensory perception? I'm a car that can do pretty magical things. So you think this could actually be a positive, seen as something that would, be, that would set this car apart as a safer car, a better car, by having this extra dome of sensors versus something that someone would go, oh, it's ugly, I don't want that. You know, we're not sure how that's going to turn out, sure. actually. But if you do look at um, just how humans are buying cars today, one of the reasons that people are buying crossovers instead of sedans is because you sit higher and you have a better view of the world. Mm. Um, similarly, our sensors really want to be as high as possible on the car so that they can see more. So it's really just a safer way to make a self-driving car. We can do a quick impromptu poll now. Uh, show of hands, would you be willing to purchase an autonomous car if it meant having a bit of a, a ball cap on top, let's say? Raise, raise your hand if you would. Well, that's, I'd say that's a safe half at least, and we're still years away from getting there, so that's a pretty good place to start, right? That's not so bad. That's not bad. Thanks for the poll. <laughs> so, four million miles in the real world. How many simulated virtual miles have you covered? So right now, um, this is an interesting statistic to wrap your head around. Right now, at this very moment, we've got about 25,000 cars driving around in our virtual world of simulation. Um, we did about two and a half billion miles in simulation over the last 12 months. Um, it's pretty astonishing. About 10 million miles a day um, in simulation, 10,000 miles of real world driving every day. And are there any problems that you are focused on at this point? Any last nuts to crack? Any corner cases that are giving you challenges as you're going forward and moving into the real world now? Or is it really just kind of fine tuning things here and there at this point? You know, weather is definitely a challenge, and it's one of the reasons why we're not launching in Michigan um, as opposed to launching in a place like Phoenix. So yeah. there's no question that we need more work um, in snowy and, and frozen environments, for sure. Um, but right now, I don't think there's anything we see on our radar screen, pardon the pun, um, <laughs> that, that we don't have a plan to attack and solve. Screen. That's great, and you know, I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand is just how many miles you guys are covering on any given day, not only in terms of the real world, but also the virtualization techniques. And how much of that has advanced since the launch of Waymo? I'm guessing that's been a big part of development as well, evolving your virtualization systems. Oh, um, so you're talking about the, our, our virtual world and yeah. the simulation. Um, we just keep getting better and better at that. And again, going back to um, one of the advantages that we have at Waymo is being a part of Alphabet. So we have access to all of that server infrastructure, um, a lot of the really bright minds at places like Google Brain. Um, we're able to tap those and use them to deploy um, to advance our work here. And that's certainly an advantage, a unique advantage, being a part of Alphabet is having uh, a lot of great minds and great services to tap into. That's right. All right. Thank you very much, John. I think we're out of time. Thank you, everyone, for attending as well. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, John. And that's the kind of conversation you don't find just on every street corner, do you? Great stuff going on.